still for being invited here and how wonderful it is and how excited I am to be here and how hard we're all going to work and what a good time we're all going to have, which I fully expect. <laughs> And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk in my four lectures about Golden Dick Teichmuller theory, which is a big, beautiful panorama containing everything you heard this morning and, and more. The main ingredient that we haven't heard about this morning, which will be coming up continually, is moduli spaces of curves, this central object in the theory. So I'm going to be taking some time to, to introduce those. But what I decided to do was to start at the end of my course notes with this last section for, for a couple of reasons. So one of them is that this is what the working group will be working on, so it's best to start with. Another one is that it's easier and simpler. It's like a simpler version of golden Dick teichmuller theory. And the third reason is that it links up really well to what we've heard this morning. In fact, I'm very grateful to Dick and Makoto for saying a lot of things that I meant to say so that my lectures will be correspondingly shorter. So what I'm going to start with is linear golden Dick teichmuller theory. And... I will not start by giving you a big picture. So afterwards, after the rest is over, we can maybe just I can come back and make a few remarks on that, and, and you'll, or you should see by yourselves really how, how it situates. But it's starting from the small end of the telescope, in a sense. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a Lie algebra. This Lie algebra is called GRT, which stands for graded GT, which stands for graded Gotedik Teichmuller. So it's a graded Lie algebra, GT, GT always means Gotedik Teichmuller, Lie algebra. And I'm going to give you the definition, and the definition consists in three defining relations. And these three relations, they're very important in Gotedik Teichmuller. They'll come back in various forms again and again through all my lectures. So the first version of them is the easiest one, the Lie algebra version. So first of all, the elements are in a much simpler Lie algebra, which is just the free Lie algebra on two generators. Now, by the end of this, show, this winter school, I think everybody is going to think that we're all crazy about P1 minus 3 points. <laughs> it isn't that we love P1 minus 3 points. It's that it's the simplest object of a certain type. And the certain type can be, there's a lot one can say. It's the if you look at curves of genus G with marked points, it's the simplest one that has non-abelian fundamental group. If you consider moduli spaces of curves, it's the first moduli space of curves. So it's the first case in a big picture, always. And that's why we keep coming back to it and starting with it and working with it. And it's pi 1, as we saw, is a free group on two generators. And if I'm talking about a free Lie algebra on two generators here, it's deep down for that reason. It's because I'm giving you the linear picture of what really is geometry of P1 minus 3 points, and that will come in the later lectures. So I don't take all elements of this Lie algebra, of course. I just pick out those satisfying three properties. The first one is that F, well, these are what are they? They're, they're polynomials in X and Y, which happen to be Lie polynomials during the Lie algebra. So I can write them f of x, y. So I ask that f of x, y plus f of y, x equals 0. And the second one's not much harder. f of x, y plus f of z, x plus f of y, z equals 0, where x, y, x plus y plus z is equal to 0. So z is just minus x minus y. The third one, the famous, famous 5 cycle, is the most exciting, the most deep, the most interesting one, but it's also the one I'll be talking about least for obvious reasons of getting there and difficulty and so forth. So I'm going to give you the definition pretty deeply. What it is is a substitution of variables. I, I'm writing down a five cycle. And I'm going to tell you what these xij's are in just a moment. But before I tell you what they are, I'm going to make them turn. There are five of them. So one, two, two, three. Would you write it more bigger? I, I oh, OK. All right. Four, five, five, one. How many have I got here? Four. One more to go. Is this okay down at the bottom? <laughs> at any rate, I've got five variables here, x, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five, one, and I've turned them cyclically. I've just made five f's that go around cyclically. So I have to tell you who these xi's are, is all. So the xi's are generators of another Lie algebra. I'm not going to get into this much, 
because we will be using it. But still, it's important to say it once. The five-strand braid So it's generated by, generated by xij's. So here I've only used one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five, one, but all ten of them generate the Lie algebra with relations. Hmm, this is where it's bad because I don't remember them, but. X, I, J for I goes from 1 to 5, and a fixed J is always 0. Do you remember them, Makoto? What's the next one? I need another relation. <laughs> I'm never going to use them, so it's not very important, but for completeness, I should put down. Ah, yes, yes, I know what it is. Yes, 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 yes. X, I, J, X, I, K, plus X... J I X J K plus X K I X K J is always equal to zero. And 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 X I I equals zero, X I J equals X J I. Okay. This is not going to be used later. But if anybody knows about braid groups, this should be very reminiscent of the five strand braid group, which we will be using later on. Okay. Now, I'm going to leave this definition for now, and I'm going to go on and introduce other things, and I will end up by, by talking about the Drinfeld associator, and all of a sudden I will come back in and say the Drinfeld associator is in here and satisfies these relations. So my lecture will be a kind of circle where I will now abandon this and go on to other things, and then suddenly and abruptly come back to it at the end, that being the main observation for today. Okay? So if you're wondering what role this will play as I go on and on not talking about it, the answer is I'm going to develop a very, very special, oh, I can, I can consider the completion of this and take power series in the x and y, which satisfy the same three relations, and I am going to create a very, very important power series in x and y. And the final result will be it satisfies these, it is in here. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about, for the rest of today, I'm going to talk about multi-zeta values. Some people call them multiple zeta values. Some people call them polyzeta values because they object to the repulsive mix of Latin and Greek in this word. <laughs> but I learned multi-zeta values, and I'm not worried too much about the Latin and Greek, so I keep calling them that by habit. OK, what are they? So we all know what the Riemann zeta function is and what its values at positive integers are. And this is just a generalization of that simple concept. Simple to state, but very difficult to understand. So I just take several integers, and I sum over increasing tuples of increasing integers. OK? And just as I do here with k, which has to be greater than or equal to 2, I'm going to have a little convergence problem. So in order to make sure this is convergent, it's a real value whenever k1 is greater than or equal to 2. So these are real numbers. When k1 is greater than or equal to 2, these are real numbers. And these are the numbers that we're going to be studying today. The, the, the point, if I were going to try and give you an idea of the big picture, is this. This is a Lie algebra. The Gromlin-Dieck Teichmuller group is going to be a profinite group very much resembling this Lie algebra, except that it's a group, but it will have the same three defining relations. And the, the group is related to number theory in a very deep way by being related to the, the absolute Galois group of q bar over q that Makoto was talking about. And the Lie algebra is reflecting it, the deep involvement with number theory by being closely related to multi-zeta values. So the the, the whole point of the Teichmuller theory, the whole point of it is this, is understanding number theory in, in a manner which is practically combinatorial. When I give an object like this with relations like this, basically we're down to basic algebraic structures and combinatorics. And we're going to use these simple structures to try and understand very, very complicated number theoretic objects. So today it's going to be these multi-zeta values, and for the rest of the time it will be Galois q bar over q. Okay. 
Now, these numbers are well known to satisfy two very beautiful relations when you multiply them. You multiply them, and you get a linear combination of them. And there are two ways to do this. So the first way, so theorem, the MZVs form a Q algebra. So what that means is quite simply, when I multiply two, I've got to get a linear combination of them. And so I'm going to show how to do that in two different ways. So proof one. This is very, very closely related to what Dick was telling us this morning. The fact is, this is a remark that looks like Euler should have found it, but it's, it's actually only 10 or 12 years old and was discovered by Konsevich. These values can be obtained as iterated integrals. One. Okay, let me do this. N. Yes. What? Q. It's a Q algebra. That's a Q there. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Better? <laughs> okay, now, I'm going to tell you exactly who this integral is. First of all, let me, to this tuple, K1, KR of integers, Oh, sorry about that. Yep. To this R tuple, I'm going to associate an N tuple, where N is called the weight, and it's just the sum of the KRs. The N tuple is going to look like this. It's going to have zeros and ones. It will always start with a zero and end with a one. And here there will be K1 minus one zeros and a 1, k2 minus 1 zeros and a 1, kr minus 1 zeros and a 1. Of course, kr's can be equal to 1 except for the first one, so it's not that there are always zeros between the ones, say. But anyway, to this tuple we associate an n-tuple. And I like this, it's very convenient. To this n-tuple, I'm also going to always associate a word in x and y. I always think x is 0, y is 1. It's just another coding for the same thing. I also am going to associate this formal word in x and y that's going to be very, very important for proof two and also for relating its situation to that. Here? Every, I'm sorry. I start big, but it keeps getting smaller. Okay, and now this tuple here is going to be epsilon n, comma, down to epsilon 1. So each time here, oh, and I forgot a minus 1. Let me just throw in minus 1 to the r. Okay? Now, this is so easy to prove that I'm not going to prove it. It's very easy to prove by induction. It's an exercise in my lecture notes. I'm going to just prove, I'm just going to show you the first case. Once you see the first case, you'll see that it's easy to see that it always works by induction. Um, the exercises in my lecture notes are specifically destined for those in my working group. Of course, anybody else can do them, too. Okay, let me just do this. So my claim is <coughs> minus. Okay? Because 2... 2 corresponds to the tuple epsilon 2 epsilon 1, which is just 0, 1. Okay, so now I could take this minus sign away and change this to 1 minus t1. And I'm just going to integrate this. So you'll see it always works this way. And the way to integrate it is to turn this into a, a power series. Take the sum outside. Integrate t1 to the n. That gives me a denominator of n plus 1. t1 to the n plus 1 evaluated between 0 and t2. I've, I've integrated it already here. So 
So it's T2 to the N dt2 now. Evaluate this integral here. And I get again T2 to the N plus 1 over N plus 1, so I now have N plus 1 squared. T2 to the N plus 1 evaluated between 0 and 1. This is just 1. So I now have this. Now if I just shift to n greater than or equal to 1, I get 1 over n squared, right? Very familiar expressions, eta 2. So uh, that's how it always works. You just successively keep expanding the 1 minus is power series and dividing by the other one, what? What? He wants you to put an integral sign next to the t2 over t2 in the second the bottom line. Which line? This line? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so now I was going to tell you how to multiply two zeta values together. That was my proof. And, but I'm lucky because actually Dick already told us this this morning. Because what we're really doing when we take this integral here is we're integrating over the simplex, what you call the, the time ordered simplex or something. Omega 1, omega n, where each omega i is just dti over ti minus epsilon i. You have my sign. And if I multiply two of these, like he said, I just take the product of the two simplices, simplexes, whatever, and, <laughs> and cut them by the shuffle product into many little simplexes. And so, well, he already gave an example. S, S, that's not very good, but I know you'll forgive me. Let me call this gamma one to gamma. And what? Help, I need a letter, N prime, M, say. Where? Well, I'm going to do an example. It will be better. But the point is, over the shuffles, Standard simplex, standard R plus S simplex, product of all the forms. Like, for instance, if I take the one I just took, which dt1 over 1 minus t1, and I just multiply it with I need a new variable name, t3. Yeah. It's bad, I really have to have more. Let me, let me take an example and change my, yeah, okay, I'll do this. I'll do it with t4. This is very bad. Okay, so this goes to T4, this one goes to T5, this one goes to 1. I multiply them. Well, I have to, each time I have to take the cyclic order between the TIs, which is ordered. So I'm going to have all these simplices, 0, T1, T2, S1, S2, S3. One. Uh, well, I should have called them S's, really. My life would have been simpler if I just called them S's. It doesn't matter. I can call them T3, T4, T5, or S. Oh, yeah, this one's a T5. I know you know what I mean. This is the part where it's never really easy to explain. So I always hope somebody else will explain it. And then I, I take All the shuffles, so it's easy to see that I'm ordering five things here, and I have to have T1, T2 come in order, and S1, S2, S3 come in order. So there are just ten possibilities. I'm not going to write all ten down, of course. But uh, here I could put S2, S, and then T2, S3, and so on. There are ten of these. Ten simplices whose union equals the product 
of the two I had before up to a set of measure zero. The set of measure zero occurs when any ti is equal to any sj, when you integrate over that zero, so it doesn't make any difference to the integral. So my final product of the two zeta values is the sum over the ten simplices. And then what I do is I take the same integration domain each time, but it's the order of the, the differential forms that appear. So the first one is going to be my t1 over t1, dt2 over t2, 1 ds2 over s2 minus 1 ds3 over s3 minus 1. Hope you're not taking notes because now I feel like having SIs here. <laughs> S3, S2, S1, yeah, it's more convenient. But anyway, I'm not going to write it all down. So this is just the first term, and then I'll have a second term, which will be dt, t1, ds, s1, dt2, t2 minus 1, ds1. I mean, it's just totally combinatoric. And so on. So I've got my 10 terms. And I just, each one is a zeta value. Each one is a multi zeta value, and I can just write down what they are. Equals zeta of, in fact, I will write what they are. Using a, using a convenient notation, I can write down quite simply what it is. I like this notation. I like to write zeta of w, where w is just the word that I had before, a word in x and y. Note that this word, k1, always has to be greater than or equal to 2, so this always starts with x and ends with y. So for any word that starts with x and ends in y, I can associate a tuple like this to it. So it's exactly the same. As long as w starts with x and ends in y, this notation is just exactly the same thing. And the product turns out this definition shows that all it is, is the, the sum over the shuffles of these two words, zeta of u. That's all it is. That's what I've been trying to do by shuffling, by cutting up the simplex into pieces. What do I mean when I shuffle two words? I mean exactly what Dick was telling us before. I've got a word here, I've got a word here, and I mix the letters in every possible way by what pre preserves the internal order of each word. Just like what I did, just did with the sympathy. So this is the major formula. And that proves the theorem. That gives my first proof of the theorem, because if I can multiply multi-data values, then they form an algebra. But I will still give you the second proof, because it's also very important. So what I've just told you is not only a proof of the theorem, but it's something more. What I've given you, this is very important, is I've given you a whole bunch of algebraic relations between multi-data values. And the point is, the dream would be to understand all algebraic relations between multi zeta values. This would be great. And there's a conjecture, which I will tell you. But I should also warn you that this is going to be incredibly difficult because we have no idea, really. We don't know anything even about the transcendence of these values. We don't know anything even about the transcendence of the, the values of the Riemann zeta function. These these, to give all algebraic relations would mean already that we know exactly the trend. Well, of course, one conjectures that they're all transcendent, but we don't know. So as long as we don't know that, there's no way we can ever give all algebraic relations. That's clear. So I'm going to give you conjecture, but it's going to be a very, very, very hard conjecture implying a huge amount of difficult things which we don't know. However, I will, I will give it to you. I'm, I'm going to say that all algebraic relations between multi zeta values are conjectured to be the family I just gave you and the family that I'm now going to give you, which comes from the second proof. The second proof is actually easier because I multiply two things. Now, instead of using the integral representation I iterated integrals and cutting out the simplex, I just use the power series representation in the definition. So M1, L1, M, S, L, S. OK, now, I make one huge sum, N1, M, 
are ms with all of them here. And I do this, taking the product of everything. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut up this sum, just the way I did before, with the ni's and the mi's all ordered with increasingly big. Okay? And so it's going to look very much like the other one. I just cut up simplices by taking separate things over the, over the different possible orders of the ni's. And now I'm going to do this. But there's a big, big difference here, which makes it ugly when it could be pretty. It's a bit sad. The difference is that whereas there, when I had the boundaries, when I had some ti equal to some sj, it went away because the integral over that was zero. Whereas here, I have to keep all of those cases. I have to not only take all the shuffles, but I also have to keep all the cases where some ni is equal to some F mj. So I'll get a, a formula that is not so bad, but not so great, which is something like a shuffle operation, but a bit more complicated. I'm just going to do it. Again, I'm just going to do it for an example. It's going to be simpler. So what actually happens when I do it? So I have 1 over n to the a, m1 greater than m2 greater than 0, 1 over m1 to the b, m2 to the c. So first I'm going to take n greater than m1 greater than m2. Then I have to take m1 greater than n greater than m2. Then I have to take m1 greater than m2 greater than n. And then I have to take n equals m1. So here I get n to the a and kind of n to the b, m2 to the c. And the last one is n equals m2. OK, now it's, it's really easy to see that these are all multi zeta values, because you can just write down what they are. It's zeta of ABC plus zeta of BAC plus zeta of BCA. So, so far, we exactly have the shuffle of A with BC. And then we have these boundary terms that do appear, which is A plus B. C and A, B plus C. Uh, no, B, A plus C. So what has to happen is that, the, what has to happen in general, this, this way of taking two sequences and putting them together is called a stuffle. Stuffle. What we're doing is they're taking the stuffle of two sequences. The word stuffle, I think, was invented by Borwein or someone, and it means shuffle and stuff. Because first you shuffle them, and then you stuff two together in the same slot. So the precise definition by recursive definition is in the notes, if you want to study that. But basically, what you do is you take all shuffles of the two sequences and all shorter sequences obtained, obtained from the shuffles shuffles by whenever two, two components in a shuffle are neighbors, but one is a k and one is an l, we're allowed to add them together. So adding, adding neighboring components from different sequences. Okay, So whenever I have a big shuffle with ki's and li's all mixed up and I have a ki next to an lj, I can replace, I can get a new by adding ki plus lj. And that gives me a shorter one. So the longest ones I get are of length l, r plus l. They're all here. And then I can add any, and I can add all the pairs that are possible. And so the shortest one I can get is when I've added everything to everything, and that, the length of that one is the max of r and s. So I get all lengths going between max r and s all the way up to r plus s. OK. So now I can give you the big, big conjectures. Two. Hmm, 
Let me, I mean, give you three. Three. Main conjectures on MZVs. All right, the first one is they are all transcendent. This is, mm, you know, I'm really, they're all transcendent. This is totally, completely out of reach. So since the other conjectures are going to be even stronger than this, this is just to give you an idea. At the same time, the conjecture as a whole is completely out of reach. At the same time, there are lots of relations, I think, which we are going to be able to study. And what people have done to get out of this situation, what they've done, which is very, very interesting, is to define new Q algebras, which are formal multidatas, in which you just take symbols and model them out by the relations you want. And then compare that with grodin teichmuller theory, with gawa q bar over Q, with the whole uh, moduli space theory. So what's bad is that we may never be able to prove these conjectures, but what's good is that we have lots and lots of things we can work with in spite of that. Lots of algebraic relations. So the first one is, mm, let me say, subconjecture of this one, actually. Subconjecture of one. There are no linear relations between MZVs of different weights. Hmm. No, I'm not going to call this subconjecture. Let me call it one prime. One prime. Closely related conjecture. Okay? Now, weights is K1 plus sol or all the sums of the KIs. That's what the weight is. Now, if we had an algebraic zeta value, if well, somebody was algebraic, some zeta k1 kr, then it would satisfy a minimal polynomial, a1 zeta to the m minus 1, and it would go down to some constant term here. If we had an algebraic one, if. Well, we saw how to, that whenever we multiply these, it becomes a linear combination in the same weight. So we just linearize by, by the two procedures, one or the other, that we just saw, and we make this into a big linear relation. And we're getting a linear relation in different weights. So this is, of course, in weight m times n. And this one here, the, the last one, would be just a weight m, and then that would be a weight 0. So this conjecture implies that one. They're, they're two closely related conjectures. So from now on, we're going to only look to study the algebraic and linear relations in a given weight. So, which makes our conjectures just that much more feasible if we look only within a given weight. The only algebraic relations between multi zeta values. So, given those two conjectures, I can say this. But I can weaken this conjecture by adding in given weight. This weakens the conjecture to something maybe more, more feasible. Come from the two families that we saw. We saw two families of algebraic relations. Zeta u zeta v equals the sum of the shuffles of u v. And Zeta K1 KR, Zeta L1 LS equals the sum over the stuffles of those two sequences, Zeta of, let me call this an S for stuffle. So this here is a sequence of integers obtained by stuffling those others. There, these are algebraic relations. Of course, we can deduce loads of others from them, but the idea is that's all there is, nothing else. Both of these are, of course, in, in a given weight. Both sides of these are in, in the same weight. Every term is of the same weight. So no relation, no algebraic relation of any kind is known which mixes any multi zetas in different weight, and of course, we firmly believe that there are none. D? Do 
No, now I'm not. Now I'm. I'm using only words starting with x and ending in y, and k one greater than or equal to two. That suffices for the conjecture. But I'm going to regularize now. But it doesn't add anything to the conjecture. What I'm going to do now, well, let me just first give you a few algebraic relations that are known between multi-zeta values. That are known, that have been proved by manipulating the series by all kinds of very, very cute ways, some 200 years ago and others very recently. For all n. In fact, so the first one, I'm just putting the first one separately because it's a very, very old. And this, I think, is more recent. And I'm not actually completely sure if this is known or not, but it's known to me. So I think it must be known to a lot of people. I haven't seen it in print. I'm going to make some remarks. I'm going to keep this more stuff in my notes. That's just the anti-co-relation on integrated integrals. Which one? This here? Yeah, both. Oh, yeah. OK. Well, this one's just the first case of that one. OK. This one, I'm just putting it in because it's old. OK. So. Loads of relations on multi zetas are known. Let me write down some more. From my little family. The sum over all possible partitions of a number is equal to the zeta of that number. Here's a recent one, due to Zagier. So you take this little block 3, 1, n times, and it's equal to 1 over 2n plus 1 zeta 2, 2. There are lots more. I'm going to introduce a whole bunch more in a minute. But what I want to say is these are known. They're known to hold for multi-zetas. What's not known is that they all come from the double shuffle. This is called the double shuffle family, I should say, by the way. Shuffle and stuff all makes double shuffle. So the conjecture is not, are these relations true, or, but do they come from double shuffle? OK, um, several of them I know that they do. Some of them I don't. This one I don't. And I don't, I'm not sure anybody does. This one, I'm not sure. But anyway, we can work with these and with a lot more and try to find out evidence in favor of conjecture too, to see if just even these basic, well-known relations do come from double shuffle. No, I don't think they're known. Well, put it this way. Do you know that they come from double shuffle? Oh, the anti-code ones? Yeah. Well, let me think about that. This relation is, I mean, I think. The fact is they do. It's not that hard to prove. I don't know if it's widely known or narrowly known. It is known. Well, I guess it's the anti-code one does. Then it may, f yeah. Let's say that that's definitely not the hardest one. Uh, these two I really don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I don't think it's known. We don't know that it's true for any n. No, no, we do. It's true. They're all true. No, no, we, we, we don't know they come from there. From, for any n. For this yeah, for any n. Right. Right, right. Of course. Say, yeah, yeah, yeah. N, it comes from this. Well, actually, even that I don't know. Again, OK, these are known. These are known, but it's a fun thing to try and deduce it. For a particular n, I think it's the, mar the radical Mapperson problem. It's not something. For a particular n, which n? <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, for any n. the whole point is n. Well, yeah. This is the same thing to say for any n and for all n, isn't it? I mean, if it's true for any n, then it's true for well, all n. No? It may be easy to say for any n, but it may be unknown if it happens for any n. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. You mean, given n, one can deduce it? Yes. Yeah, 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 sure. It's a very different thing, and that's why in the working group, I hope what we're going to be doing is we're going to play with small values of n. Oh, yeah, no, no. It's much, much harder to prove something bang for all n, of course. And that would be, also, it depends. It depends. Some of them, some of them fall out for all n pretty easily. Well, well, we'll see that for those who are working with me. But it's, we're not going to get into the technical nitty gritty of that here. Definitely not. That's for evening work. OK, what I want to finish up with, I guess I have 10 minutes. What I want to finish with, is that right? 10 minutes? Yeah, 10 minutes. Is a final family of new relations on zetas. Really, really important ones. A big, big family that they're known to satisfy and that is not known that it comes from here. 
and it's the Grodin Nick Teichmuller relations. So I need a definition, and the definition that I need is the Drinfeld associator. So it's going to take me a couple of steps to, to define the Drinfeld associator. Really, it's going to just take me one initial step, and this is what it is. I now want to extend the definition of zeta of a word, so word in x and y, from what I already have, words x, v, y, where v is any word, but starting in x and ending in y, to all words, to all words, in such a way that this relation that I already had, zeta u, zeta v equals the sum of the shuffles, will be true for all u and v, not just what I had over there. What I had over there was only for the ones that started x and end in y. I hadn't even defined a zeta for the, the other words yet. But I'm going to do that now. I'm going to do that. I'm going to give you the definition. I won't prove it. It's a big and very, very beautiful theorem that's due to work of a lot of people. So discovering how to define the value of zeta w for other words w was, well, of course, Drinfeld introduced the idea of his associator, but it was really Le Murakami who figured out how to compute these extended values, but even with them, their formula is given in a, in a rather particular way. It's work by Furusho. They gave the formula, the very explicit, particular, simple, beautiful, easy formula that I'm going to give now. And this is really a lot of work that led to this formula. And here, here it is. I'm going to take any word, any word. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it y to the a, v, x to the b, where v starts in y, x and ends in y. So v is what we call a convergent word corresponding to the fact that the zeta associated is a convergent zeta value. And I'm going to define this new zeta w to be the double sum from r0 to a, s0 to b, minus 1 to the r plus s, zeta of pi of Hmm, forgot a shuffle. I need a new letter here. U. U in the shuffle, I should say, is obviously a binary operation. So obviously, if you just look at it, you'll see that it's associative. So I can shuffle three things. Doesn't matter which order I do it in. So I'm going to shuffle three things here. I'm going to shuffle y to the r, y to the a minus r, v, x to the b minus s, and x to the b. So this here is just a shuffle of the three words. It's, it's a, a large set of words. Zeta of pi of u. What? X to the... Yeah, sorry. Right. Where I just have to tell you what pi means. And that's very, very simple. Pi is just a projector. Pi is something that hates non-convergent words. U, if U starts in X, ends in Y, zero otherwise. Pi is a projector onto the convergent words. Okay? Now, to prove this, this, that this definition satisfies this formula at all times, this is a big, beautiful theorem. Okay? And which I'm certainly not going to be covering here. What's a convergent word? It starts in X and ends in Y. No. No, no. Uh, we're, we consider a convergent word is that the k ones associate. I write the word x to the k1 minus 1y, x to the kr minus 1y, but the krs can be 1. Uh, but all that I have to say for this to be convergent is, well, for kr to even be there, it has to end in y, by definition. And this well, we know that for this to convert, it has to be greater than or equal to 2. So it has to start with an x. 
it's, it's the word convergent words for these words just comes from that fact. Okay? And now we don't need it anymore. We don't need it anymore because we now have a zeta defined on all words by this formula that satisfies the shuffle relation always. So now I can define the Drinfeld associator. I'm going to define two versions of it. First, the big version. It has a KZ here in Drinfeld's own traditional notation because it, I'm just giving you the definition. I'm not telling where it comes from. It comes from condition exam logic of differential equations. And it's just minus 1 to the dw zeta w for all words w, dw equals number of y's in the word. W is all words. When W is the trivial, the empty word, we've got a term one out here. Huh? Yeah? It's zero, zero, zero. Zeta is a linear function. We consider zeta, you, zeta of zero to be zero. Zeta of zero is zero. No, no. Okay. What? Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So, what is it? It's a power series in x and y. It's a formal power series in the non-commutative variables x and y with real coefficients. Okay. Now, consider in my last four minutes, consider n z equals z mod product where z equals the q algebra of multi zeta values that we already saw. So z is equal to q plus q zeta of 2 plus q zeta of 3 plus, and you've got multi zeta values here of higher and higher weight, and it's not always a direct sum because we don't know if there are linear relations or not between the weight, but at least here we know that it's a direct sum. And let me mod out not only by all products, but also by the Q and the Q zeta of two parts. So what I get here is NZ is just a vector space. I'm dropping a lot of structure here. NZ for the moment is just a vector space. Graded by the weight, by the weight. Yeah, I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better. I'm actually going to let z be the formal zn, where z0 is q, z1 is 0, zn equals the vector space of weight and multi zetas. But I, but I direct sum them all. That is, I'm really making the conjecture here that there are no linear relations. I'm pretending there are no linear relations. So what I've really got here is I've got a surjection onto the real NZVs. And I, I, it's, the conjecture says that this is an, also an injection, but I don't know. So I'm going to take this Z here, and I'm going to quotient it out by Z0, Z2, and Z greater than or equal to 2 squared. Now it's graded. Now my, my uh, vector space is graded by the weight, so direct sum. And it's in weights greater than or equal to 3. I could take z greater than or equal to 0, greater than 0 squared. Yeah, it's just as well. It's a thing. And what happens is I've got my algebraic relations that I had now become relations, linear relations in my vector space. They now become this equals 0 and this equals 0. So inside each graded piece of my vector space, I now have a bunch of linear relations. And I'm just going to set phi equals image of phi kz ma in nz. So it's the same, except that here, the coefficients are now considered to be in nz, not z. So the coefficients now satisfy all these linear relations that we know. And the big theorem that I'm going to finish with is quite simple, but very, very deep. Big theorem due to Drinfeld himself is phi 
So I, let me put a little bar here to explain that these are in NZ is in GERT. Satisfies those three relations. So just to, this is the result that I would really, really like to investigate. This is known, it's known. But what it does is it gives a ton of new algebraic relations on the zetas. Just this fact, just the relation one, plug it in and look what it tells you about multi zetas. It's a whole bunch of new relations on the coefficients, and it's absolutely not known if they come from this. So, conjecture two is not known. Yeah, well, we don't know they come from these, but we conjecture they do. Why, why do we care about conjecture two? Why can't we just throw in all sort of known relations? Huh. <laughs> if we knew what all the relations were, it would be much easier to study. For example, the ones that come from Trinfeld's theorem here, for example. The less you have, the better it is. The point is to understand the structure of GERD. It depends what it is that you want to prove. Okay? If you want to. If we could prove this, if we could prove that these imply those, then we would have a new definition of GERT. We wouldn't need relations one, two, and three. We could just substitute these. Well, we have to prove both directions. We would have to imply, prove that these apply those and those apply these. This is conjectured. So then we would have a new definition of GERT without those three relations, but with these two relations, of which the first one really just says it's a Lie element. So in fact, we don't have one bunch of relations instead of the three. It would be much, much better to work with. Okay, and the point is that the structure of GERT reflects the structure of the, the GT, which reflects the structure of Gawa Q bar over Q. So the closer we can get to getting into this very simple family, I should have, I should mention to finish that when you, when you put this equals zero in the linear in NZ, it just means it's a Lie polynomial, an element of Lie XY. So we have new relations on zetas. And the big conjecture is, are all algebraic relations that we have on zetas coming from these, and in particular, is this big family coming from these? I mean, you've got, li literally, this is now a set of linear relations, you know, and it's, these are linear relations, and you know, it's, it's a linear system, this one implies that one. Linear relations. Just linear. You, we could, I could have rephrased everything in terms of the algebra, but even then it would just be how do you derive some algebraic relations given other algebra? You've got an ideal of algebraic relations, are these elements in them? That's all it is. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. What I mean when I say, can it, I don't mean a linear combination. If you're working in this case, all I mean is you take the ideal of these algebraic relations and are these any new ones that you're looking at in that ideal. That's all I mean. And if you're looking at the linear relations, it's even better. What was your question? This is a power series in X and Y. These W's are words in X and Y. It's a power series in X and Y. I just switch X and Y and I add that new power series. I add them together. And then I compare coefficients of each word. And those are the relations I get on the zetas. Zeta of W, no. Zeta of W is a real number. No, no. Zeta of W, when W is convergent, it's zeta of K1, KR. It's a real number. When zeta is not convergent, it's a linear combination of real numbers, given right here. The coefficients. The coefficients are real numbers, except that now I mod it out by product, so it's in a quotient algebra. But pretty much you can think of them as being real numbers. And the Ws are in X and It's a power series with real coefficients in X and Y. When I take y, phi of Yx and I add them, now I look at each coefficient. And those are linear combinations in the zetas. And those are where I'm getting my new relations from. Yes, yes, phi of X and Y, absolutely. Everywhere that I just wrote phi, it should have been phi of xy. Power series in x and y. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was just an example. This 
this is just saying, look at this. Already you can see that you get all these new relations by looking at each coefficient of this, and then you have the three-term relation and the five-term relation. So you get three big families of new relations. All worth seeing if, if they really come from here. It's not my fault, huh? Yeah, okay. I'll buy that. I'll buy that. We get relations which look new but may not be new because <laughs> let's let's call old relations relations that come from here. So so can we let's thank the speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.